Yes, I want you. So please, let's start with a small prayer. Allow us in Greek. Λογητό ο Θεό ημών πάντοτε νυν και αή και σώνο των αιώνων. Δόξη Χριστέ ο Θεό, ελπισίμων δόξα η Βασιλεία Φουράνη, παράκλητε το βνέμα τη αληθεία, ο πανταχού παρών και τα πάντα πληρώνουν τη σαυρό των αγαθών και η ζωή χορηγό ευθέ και σκύνο σε μυτικά θάρρηση μα σε πα και λίδο και σε όσων αγαθέα τα σπιχά ημών. Good morning to all. I would like to welcome you to the premises of the Holy Synod of the Church of Greece. It is an honor and a privilege to have you all here today. I would like, first of all, uh, to address properly our official guests. And I'm starting by the representatives, uh, first of the Archbishop of Athens in all Greece, Metropolitan Ignatius from Volos, I would like to welcome Metropolitan of uh, Guinea, George, who is representing his uh, Beatitude, the Patriarch of Alexandria, Theodoros. I would like to welcome the Archbishop of the Armenian Church, uh, Father Keram. Welcome with all the Armenian delegation. Metropolitan from the Coptic Church, welcome. It's an honor to have you here. And, uh, the Ambassador of the, of the United Kingdom in Greece, Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Uh, who else I see? Several representatives from uh, other organizations of the Church of Greece and also from political organizations. You are most welcome and thank you for being here today. Uh, Father Leonard, the Apocrisarius of the Anglican Church in Greece, a very good friend and uh, dear brother in Christ, welcome in the office, in the premises of the Holy Synod. And I uh, left for the, for the end our official guest, the Bishop of Truro, Dr. Philip Mount Stephen. Welcome, you are most welcome, dear Bishop, in uh, the Church of Greece. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here, and we are very grateful that you found the time to be with us in these uh, difficult times for Greece. We are suffering of a very horrible accident that took place a week ago, and uh, 57 Greeks, fellow Greeks, uh, lost their lives in a terrible train accident that took place in uh, the territory of Tebi in central Greece. And uh, we are mourning for the loss of uh, the souls of our sisters and brothers. And please do uh, the same and pray for, the, for their souls, because every Greek right now is suffering of what unfortunately took place uh, in our country. I would like before uh, present uh, Bishop of uh, Turo to present to all of you the three panelists that we have the honor and a privilege to have them with us today. And I'm starting by my professor, Metropolitan Athanasios of Achaia, that uh, for the last 23 years was uh, the representative and the director of the Office of the Church of Greece uh, in the European Union in Brussels. And uh, I first met him when I was a student of him in Geneva in uh, 98, and it is a privilege to have you here today, Your Grace. He's an expert in the EU matters, and also uh, for the many decades that he's involved in the ecumenical movement, starting by his uh, position in Bosse as a professor and director, he has developed an extremely profound knowledge of the ecumenical movement, and uh, in the Church of Greece, is a pillar person for the ecumenical movement towards the future. Second is uh, our secretary of the Synodical Committee of the Inter-Christian and Inter-Religious Relations, Father Ignatius Sotiriadis, who is running uh, the permanent committee in the Holy Synod, Your Grace, 
addressing to the Holy Synod all the issues and coordinating all the uh, important issues that needs to be addressed and receiving decisions from the side of the Church of Greece. And last but not least, my very good friend, Dr. Vasilios Mihanejidis, who is actually is working as an international director of the international affairs of the NGO Apostoli mission of the Archdiocese of, uh, of Greece. And uh, he's also uh, giving uh, lessons to the university in the canon law, uh, if I am not making mistake, uh, sector. He's also an expertise in the issues of uh, genocides. And it is very important to have, him, to have him here today. And thank you, Dr. Mehanejidis, for your time. Before I give you the floor, Your Grace, allow me to convey to you the best wishes and the true love in Christ of our uh, President of the Synod, Archbishop of Athens and Greece, Hieronymus. Unfortunately, due to his heavy schedule, he cannot be with us today, but Metropolitan Ignatius is representing him, and we are grateful that uh, he gave us the, his blessings to uh, initiate this uh, event today. Thanks to a very important person that we have in Greece, Europe Chrysarius, Father Leonard Dullen. Mm -hmm. He was the one that uh, came to, to me in my office addressing uh, your work, your report, your tremendous report, and I really thank him of uh, his uh, uh, proposal and his idea to finalizing this very important uh, event today. Metropol uh, Bishop of Truro, Philip Mount Stephen, he is born in the 13th of July, 1959, sorry, but he's still here, very young. He's a British Anglican bishop and a missionary. He has been the bishop of Turo since November 2018. From, th from 2012 to 2018, he was the executive leader of the Church Mission Society and previously worked for the Church Pastoral Aid Society and he has served in parish ministry in the Diocese of, of Oxford and the Diocese of South Wark and the Diocese in Europe. He has a very large experience in the ecumenical movement and uh, I'm excited of your report. I read it and I, I allow me to congratulate you of the work that you have done. I will not, I will not say more about uh, your report. Uh, please pass the floor to you and uh, we are delighted to hear you of what you have present what you have prepared for us to present. And uh, I suggest, because as, I, as I've been heard, we have, uh, we have to end at one o'clock, Father Leonard. Okay, so we will give you the floor for uh, your presentation, and then I will ask the three esteemed panelists to make a comment and also um, uh, pose to you some questions. And then we will open the, the, the discussion to the floor for everyone, uh, if you are wishing to make any questions or any other uh, remarks. So please, uh, Your Grace, the floor is yours. Thank you. Aisto to Patros, Katu Huyu, Katu Hagiuchnumatos, Amen. Kali Sarakosti. Well, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction, your, your eminences, uh, uh, your excellency, um, your graces, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great, great pleasure to be with you. And I am truly honored to speak here in the office of the Holy Synod. I am very conscious of what an honor that is, and I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to the Archbishop of Canterbury's I'll try and get that right, Apocrisiarios. Father Leonard Doolan for uh, enabling all of this to be hap uh, to happen. I'm very grateful, as I say, for your welcome, both to me and to my friend and colleague Sir Charles Hall, who was the secretary to the work of the review that I was commissioned to do for the Foreign Office and which I will tell you about shortly. But first, I do want to dedicate this lecture today both to the memory of those who suffered in the appalling uh, train crash of uh, of a week ago, and I do 
send you my sincere condolences on that uh, awful event. But I also dedicate it to the memory of a young man called Chris Parry. Chris was a young man from Cornwall, where I serve, and he died whilst rescuing civilians from Russian aggression in Ukraine. And his funeral is taking place this morning while I'm here in Athens in our cathedral in Truro. So today I want to honor his memory and his sacrificial service of others. And the issues in the conflict in Ukraine are very relevant to this subject that I address today, persecution, ancient scourge, modern crisis. I had an unusual start to my Christmas in 2018 when I was rung by the Archbishop of Canterbury, not to wish me a happy Christmas, but to ask if I would be willing to lead a review of the way the Foreign Office had addressed, or otherwise, the persecution of Christians. This was a request from the then Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt himself, who was very moved by the issue and very concerned about the human stories of those caught up in persecution and worried that the Foreign Office was not doing enough about it. To be honest, it was terrible timing for me because I had not even started in Truro, but I knew already what an important issue it is, and so I said yes. And with the help of Sir Charles and others, we set the work of the review up. We had just six months in which to report. Now, in the UK in recent years, we have had some very significant judge-led public inquiries, and this was definitely not one of those. Uh, if they were full body scans, to use a, a, a medical image, we had a thumb and a thermometer. We took the temperature and we felt the pulse. But actually, as doctors know, you can tell a lot just by doing that. And I'm very confident in the broad thrust of our conclusions and our recommendations because, as I will demonstrate, they were underpinned by some very significant primary research. But why was this work needed? It is now several years since the Times of London published an editorial entitled Spectators at the Carnage. And it began like this. Across the globe, in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, Christians are being bullied, arrested, jailed, expelled, and executed. Christianity is by most calculations the most persecuted religion of modern times, yet Western politicians until now have been reluctant to speak out in support of Christians in peril. Well, very happily, Jeremy Hunt was willing to speak out, and so we set the review up. In some ways, it seems as if the persecution of Christians today has come out of a, a clear blue sky. It was a real issue in the days of the Cold War, when Christians and churches in many contexts in the Soviet bloc experienced very significant pressure. After 1989, however, it seemed to recede, only to creep up on us by degrees in the intervening period. There are two striking factors behind its re-emergence. First, where once it seemed only to be located behind the Iron Curtain, it has re-emerged now as a truly global phenomenon. But it is not a single global phenomenon. It has multiple causes, multiple drivers. The second striking factor is that because the re-emergence of Christian persecution has been gradual and has lacked a single cause, it has to some significant extent been overlooked in the West. And the Western response, or lack of response, has been tinged by a certain post-Christian bewilderment, if not embarrassment, about matters of faith and a consequent failure to grasp how, for the vast majority of the world's inhabitants, faith, religious belief, is crucial to how they see themselves and to how they behave. Faith and belief are simply not a leisure pursuit, as all too often we see it in the UK, 
but are fundamental markers of identity, both for individuals and for communities. At the launch of the review in January 2019, I outlined six reasons why I felt that it was necessary to focus specifically on the plight of Christians, and I will repeat those six reasons now. First, we have to appreciate that today the Christian faith is primarily a phenomenon of the global south, and it is therefore primarily a phenomenon of the global poor. It is not primarily an expression of white Western privilege. And unless we understand that it is primarily a phenomenon of the global poor, we will never give this issue and we will never give those people the attention that they deserve. Second, this particular focus on Christian persecution is justified, I said, because Christian persecution, like no other form of persecution, is a global phenomenon. And it is so because the Christian faith is a truly global phenomenon. Christian persecution is not limited to one context or challenge. It is a single global phenomenon, but with multiple causes, and as such it deserves special attention. And I think it is really important to say this. It is certainly not limited to Islamic majority contexts. And my review was never going to give, as you might say, ammunition to the Islamophobic right wing. To focus on one cause of persecution alone is to be blind to many others. Third, I said Christian persecution is a human rights issue and we should see it as such. Freedom of religion or belief is arguably the most fundamental human right because so many others depend on it. In the West, we tend, or certainly in the UK, we tend to set one right over against another. But in much of the world, this right to freedom of religion or belief is not in opposition to others, but rather is the one upon which so many others depend. And I believe that we in the UK need to be aware of such dependencies and not dismiss freedom of religion or belief as irrelevant to other rights. In other words, if freedom of religion or belief is removed, so many other rights are put in jeopardy as well. Fourth, I said this is not about special pleading for Christians, rather it is about making up a significant deficit, a debt. In the UK, we have been blind to this issue, partly because of what you might call post-colonial guilt, a sense that we have interfered uninvited in certain places in the past, so we should not do so again. But this, I said, is not about special pleading for Christians. Rather, it is about ensuring that Christians in the Global South have a fair deal and a fair share of the UK's attention and concern. So it is an equality issue. If one minority is on the receiving end of 80% of religiously motivated discrimination, it is simply not just that they should receive so little attention. Fifthly, however, I said this is also about being sensitive to discrimination and persecution of all minorities. Because the Christian faith is perhaps the one true, truly global faith, it has become a, a bellwether, a, an indicator of repression more generally. If Christians are being discriminated against in one context or another, then you can be certain that other minorities are too. So renewing a focus on Christian persecution might actually be a way of expressing our concern for all minorities who find themselves under pressure. And if we ignore Christian persecution, we may well be ignoring other forms of repression as well. And finally, to look at this from a specifically Christian perspective, I said that the Christian faith has always been subversive. Jesus is Lord, those three words, is perhaps the earliest Christian creed. And those words were not empty. They explain why from the earliest days the Christian faith attracted persecution. To say that Jesus is Lord was to say that Caesar was not Lord as he claimed to be. So from its earliest days the Christian faith presented 
a radical challenge to any power that made absolute claims for itself. Christian faith should make no absolute political, claim, political claims for itself, but it will always challenge those who do, which is precisely why the persecution of Christians is a global phenomenon and not a local or a regional one. There are many, many powers in the world today who make absolute claims for themselves. And I suggest that confronting absolute power is certainly a legitimate concern and policy objective of any democratic government. Indeed, the Christian faith's challenge to absolute claims to power explains why it has been such a key foundation stone of Western democratic government, and it explains too why we should continue to support it vigorously whenever it is under threat. Nonetheless, the focus of the review's recommendations are clearly on guaranteeing freedom of religion or belief for all, for everyone, and not just for some. To argue to make a special case for one group over another would, I believe, be deeply unchristian. And it would also, ironically, expose that group to greater risk by isolating them and unintentionally portraying them as agents of the West. We must seek freedom of religion or belief for everyone, without fear and without favor. So I am concerned with rights for all. So I want to acknowledge the significant persecution other communities have suffered. The Rohingya community in Myanmar have suffered terribly, as have the Yazidis in Iraq. The Ahmadi Muslims have been persecuted since the very beginning. It is right to recognize the suffering of Christians in India and China, but it would be very wrong to ignore the persecution of Muslim communities in those countries, including the Uyghur Muslims, who have suffered appallingly. In many places in the world, it is certainly not safe to admit that you are an atheist. Jehovah's Witnesses have exp experienced severe persecution historically and are not free of it today. And of course, Christians have also historically been the persecutors of others. I think with shame of the Crusades, and I recognize how, how terribly Orthodox communities suffered through the Crusades. I think of the Inquisition. I think of the pogroms. But this is not just an historical phenomenon. Some of the violence in the Central African Republic can be laid at the door of those who claimed to be Christians. And responsibility for the dreadful massacre of 8,373 Bosniaks in Srebrenica in July 1995 must be laid at the feet of those two who call themselves Christians. So I wanted to be able to justify the work of the review and indeed to found the work of the review, both on values that were acceptable in terms of Western liberal democracy, so its recommendations would produce concrete results, and because I believe in those values, and I wanted to found them on in ways that were commensurate with and indeed drawn from the Christian faith because there was an issue of my own integrity in all of this as well. And I do not indeed want to set the values of Western liberal democracy and the Christian faith too much in opposition to one another because the one owes so much to the other. So then, how did we go about the work of the review? The first thing we did was to establish a working definition of persecution. We said this, in the absence of an agreed and much needed academic definition of persecution, the review has proceeded on the understanding that persecution is discriminatory treatment where that treatment is accompanied by actual or perceived threats of violence or other forced coercion. Having established that definition, I put together a team, along with Sir Charles, made up of independent members, along with people from some of the key non-government organizations, supported by staff from the Foreign Office. And then we drew up a map 
of the global situation, which we published in Easter 2019 as the interim report. We then selected a few focus countries so as to analyze the general situation there, there and un then undertook some in-depth case studies of particular cases of persecution in those places and examined how the Foreign Office had responded, if indeed it had. We also compared the Foreign Office response with what other countries and international bodies were doing globally to address the situation, as well as examining some key documents from the Foreign Office itself. And all of that was in underpinned by a very significant body of research. Members of the review team undertook in-person visits to a number of countries, places such as Hong Kong, Nigeria, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Egypt, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates, and that is not a complete list. In country, members of the team met both with foreign office officials and, crucially, with members of local Christian communities to take evidence from them. Additionally, we surveyed every single British embassy or high commission around the world with a searching questionnaire, and of course we processed all the information uh, returned to produce a fuller picture of the Foreign Office response to the issue. We received a steady stream of written submissions, including some first-hand and deeply harrowing accounts of persecution covering all six global regions that we focused on in the report. In April 2019, the team undertook two weeks of closed evidence sessions in Westminster Abbey, where we heard from 75 people, survivors of persecution amongst them, sharing often harrowing stories of their suffering. And in all, we heard evidence from 23 specific countries. As a consequence, we were able to produce an evidence-based report which focused in great detail on a number of countries and on a number of specific incidents in those countries, analyzing the Foreign Office response to them at the same time. So the review constitutes a very significant body of evidence. It, uh, can, the, the, it consists of no fewer than 176 pages with 718 footnotes. And the website christianpersecutionreview.org.uk contains yet more evidence deliberately archived there for future research purposes. So what did we find? At one point in the review, I say that there are two fundamental threats to human flourishing and harmonious communities in the world today. One is climate change, and the other is the systematic denial of freedom of religion or belief in different places and in many different ways globally. That was not a conviction I had when the review's work began, but it grew on me as the work progressed. I was shocked by the scale, the scope, and the severity of the phenomenon. I think we've begun to realize the importance of addressing climate change. It is high time now that we recognize the importance of addressing the denial of freedom of religion or belief. But how do I justify that general assertion. The most chilling aspect, I think, of George Orwell's book, 1984, is the existence of the thought police and the concept of thought crime. Why the most chilling? Because to be denied the liberty to believe what you want to believe, and I include in that the right not to believe, that is the most fundamental denial of human rights. And therefore, I believe that freedom of religion or belief is not simply one right amongst many, but the one on which so many others depend. Because if you are not free to think or believe, how can you order your life in any other way that you choose? And that is certainly what Eleanor Roosevelt, the prime framer of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, believed. And yet what we found is that in so many places around the world, we see this right questioned, compromised, and threatened. So we do need to ask why the violation of freedom of religion or belief is so widespread and affecting Christians on pretty much every continent. This, as I said before, is a global phenomenon with multiple drivers. 
even though there are many who would like to attribute it to one cause alone, namely Islam. But if you lift the, the stone of persecution, to use that image, and look underneath, what is it that you find? Well, in contexts where governments are weak, you find gang warfare on an industrial scale driven by drug crime. Elsewhere, you find authoritarian, totalitarian regimes that are intolerant both of dissent and of minorities. You find aggressive, militant nationalism that insists on uniformity. You find religious zealotry and fundamentalism in many different forms that often manifests itself in violence. And often you find those phenomena combined as well. In other words, we find massive threats to human flourishing and harmonious communities. And ultimately, we find in those things significant threats to our own security and well-being in the West as well. So if we care about these grave issues, and these are very serious issues in the world today, we should certainly care about the persecution of Christians and about freedom of religion or belief more generally. We can no longer say that this is a, a, an issue just for a special interest group, just for a small group of people on the margins. These are huge issues that we face in the world today. And sadly, the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic, has only made this situation worse. Weak governments have had to give all their attention to managing the pandemic. Authoritarian regimes used the situation to gather more power to themselves. Militant nationalists tended to blame minorities for the ills and the suffering that they faced. And religious fundamentalism used the, the crisis as a cloak for increased persecution. And to come back to the issue of climate change and freedom of religion or belief, I suggest that they're not just the two critical issues of our time, they may be even more connected than that. In the end, only states with a commitment to plurality and a heart for the common good, that's to say a good beyond themselves rather than their own self-interest, only such states are going truly to care about these issues. To put it simply, I doubt very much whether either Kim Jong-un in North Korea or the Taliban in Afghanistan are that concerned about climate change, and they certainly don't care about freedom of religion or belief. But action on freedom of religion or belief and action on climate change have common roots and spring from a common concern for the common good. So promoting one will inevitably help the other. Both are about the proper rebalancing of a world that is badly unbalanced. It's about our determining to seek the common good for the health and welfare both of the planet and of all humanity. Jeremy Hunt texted me last summer saying that the last few years have been bad globally for democracies and good for autocracies. And it's no surprise, therefore, that those years have been bad too, both for the planet and for freedom of religion or belief. It's a sad fact that the last decade has seen a significant rise in both CO2 emissions and persecution in the world's two most populous countries in India and China. And that, I suggest, is no coincidence. I'm not saying that the one causes the other, but I do believe that there is a moral relationship between those two. The fact is that there are many sinister forces at work in the world today, with many suffering as a consequence. And as I say, the situation is getting worse, not better. It has got worse since my report was published. India and China were hardly on the radar a decade ago. But look at the genocidal fate of the Uyghurs in China. The very respected Pew Research considers India the worst place globally for societal violence against minorities. Russia has become increasingly intolerant of faith minorities. The situation for religious minorities in Crimea is significantly worse now than it was before Russia's illegal annexation of it. So the time for inaction and indifference is over. 
And therefore, as the report argues, if the Foreign Office took this issue with the seriousness it deserves, then it would simply enable them to do their job better by helping them better to address some very serious current global phenomena. So how is the UK Foreign Office doing? Well, I can only say what I found nearly three years ago, not how things are now. But what we found was a mixed picture. Good in parts, uh, but not so good in others. Though I'm sure, of course, that it's all handled excellently here in the embassy in Athens. And I am genuinely grateful to the many people at the Foreign Office who allowed this unknown bishop and his team to peer into many aspects of their work. One problem we found is that many diplomats didn't stay long in post, so didn't get to know the country in the way that they might. And much too depended on the commitment, too much depended on the commitment of individual diplomats rather than the implementation of Foreign Office policy. The Foreign Office has something called the Freedom of Religion or Belief Toolkit, which embassies are supposed to use, but we found that many didn't, and some, I'm afraid to say, didn't even know it existed. It requires embassies to engage in advocacy on behalf of individuals and minority communities, and again, some do, but others didn't. In, in general, we found that much more could be done to help diplomats grasp the significance of faith in today's world. So we were taken to task, not by Foreign Office diplomats, by Foreign Office civil, services, civil servants, because we made an assertion in our interim report that Sub-Saharan Africa was a, was a majority Christian region. Now that seemed to us to be such an obvious thing to say that we really didn't feel it needed justifying, but they disputed it. So in the final report, we did indeed justify it with a simple reference to readily available academic research figures online. And to my mind, the fact that those, those experts, apparent experts, uh, didn't realize that Sub-Saharan Africa is a majority Christian region was very worrying indeed. A further example of this is the approach that's been taken to the violence in the middle belt of Nigeria and the phenomenon of the conflict associated with the Fulani herdsmen. The standard Foreign Office line has been that this is an old conflict between contrasting lifestyles exacerbated by climate change. In other words, the religious dimension of the conflict is significantly underplayed. Around 18 months ago, the then relevant government minister claimed in a letter, and I quote, to be unaware of substantiated evidence that extremist Islamist ideology is a driver of intercommunal attacks. I'm afraid that is so completely at odds with the evidence, including the evidence that we cited in our report, as to be literally incredible. And of course, whilst the Foreign Office continues to claim that there is no religious component to the violence, they will fail to come up with religiously literate responses to it. I am very pleased to say, however, that just a few weeks ago, the relevant government minister, Andrew Mitchell MP, in a letter did acknowledge the very significant religious component to the violence in that region. So I'm very pleased to see that uh, progress is being made. And as my report argued, abuse of freedom of religion or belief certainly intersects with other key issues which the Foreign Office does indeed take seriously. If you violate a person's religious freedom, then you will almost certainly be violating other key human rights, such as freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, freedom from torture, and the very right to life itself. And yet that is the lot of religious minorities the world over. If the right to freedom of religion or belief falls, so many other rights fall too. Thus, many religious minorities, many Christians amongst them, live in much greater poverty and suffer from greater food insecurity than do members of the majority community. Many religious minorities are ethnically distinct as well, so there are simple issues of racism at work here too. There is a particular intersection between the denial of freedom of religion or belief and gender equality. Globally, 
Christian women are far more likely to be victims of discrimination and persecution, including people trafficking, gender-based violence, kidnapping, forced conversion, and forced marriage than are men or members of the majority community. Thus, they suffer double discrimination. They are marginalized and abused simply because they are both women and Christians. So my point is this. We cannot see this as a special interest issue of interest only to a few. It bears upon some deeply serious issues in today's world, issues with which Western European governments should be hugely concerned. It bears upon issues such as trade, poverty, security, racism, women's rights, and the very right to life itself. And that is why I argued that freedom of religion or belief should be central to the Foreign Office's operation and culture, and that a commitment to it should be enshrined in strategic and operational guidelines. So if the Foreign Office cares about those issues which I've just uh, mentioned, and it certainly does, then it should certainly be concerned about Christian persecution, because if it takes Christian persecution seriously, and abuse of freedom of religion or belief more generally seriously, it will also become more effective at addressing those other issues. So what then did we recommend? And I am coming to a conclusion. As I said, this is a serious issue and it needs serious responses. And that is why the 22 recommendations of the review are as bold and far-reaching as I believe them to be, arguing that freedom of religion or belief should be front and center in the Foreign Office's policy and operations. There are two main thrusts to the recommendation. Central to them is the argument that the Foreign Office should promote freedom of religion or belief indiscriminately and for everyone, everyone and not just for Christians. I argue that for two main reasons. First, to single out any one community makes it even more vulnerable, and we have to avoid that. That is why the recommendations of my review warn against doing that to the Christian community. If we exercise favoritism towards Christians, we risk portraying them as agents of the West, and we thus increase their vulnerability. And of course, Christians in Egypt and India, for example, do not wish to be portrayed as a Western import, but as authentically and fully Indian and Egyptian. After all, there have been Christians in India and Egypt much longer than there have been, certainly in my country. So my clear conviction is that the single best way to protect Christians from persecution is not to single them out for special treatment, but to guarantee freedom of religion or belief for everyone. And secondly, it is not part of the Christian tradition to seek special favors. We must love our neighbors indiscriminately without picking and choosing or exercising any favoritism or making a special case for ourselves. So the first main thrust is that the Foreign Office should promote freedom of religion or belief for all. And the second is that the Foreign Office must address this issue more proactively and face it head on. Indeed, as I say, I have recommended that, the Foreign Office, that this issue should be central to the Foreign Office's culture, policy, and international operations. I say again, this is not a peripheral issue that could be relegated to the, to the margins. It touches on key and critical issues in the world today. And having made those 22 recommendations, something remarkable then happened. Not just the Foreign Office, but the UK government as a whole accepted the recommendations of the report in full, and they confirmed that commitment after the 2019 election. And that was certainly more than I hoped for and expected. And I would certainly say that the issue is now on the political radar in the UK in a way that it simply wasn't before. In particular, I was delighted by the appointment of Fiona Bruce MP as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Fiona has a long track record of commitment to this issue and is doing a magnificent job to ensure the implementation of my recommendations in full and to ensure that the government's reality matches its rhetoric. One further subsequent development is also worthy of note. 
Following the publication of the review, we established something called the UK Freedom of Religion or Belief Forum. This gathers together 90 different groups from a wide range of backgrounds, humanist, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu, and others. We liaise closely with the all-party parliamentary group on freedom of religion or belief, as well as the special envoy, and the forum is deliberately action-focused, enabling different stakeholders to make common cause on issues of mutual concern. And an early example of this was Humanists UK and CSW, an avowedly Christian organization, ch campaigning together in support of the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, arrested and now imprisoned because of his activities in that role. And I look forward to the forum continuing to catalyze significant activity to defend and promote freedom of religion or belief worldwide. Subsequently, too, the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance has been set up, which consists now of 42 states. And last summer, the UK hosted a major international freedom of religion or belief ministerial conference, at which I know a number of people from Greece were present. Indeed, we met there. So my review is part of an international movement of great and growing significance. Indeed, I think that my review has given some momentum to that movement. And we need the voice of Greece in this. We need the voice of Greece as a key member of the International Alliance for Religious fr Freedom or Belief. We need that voice to be heard in the global uh, conversation. We need Greece's voice to be heard clearly, especially in the light of the current difficulties in orthodoxy caused by the situation in Ukraine. Russia's geopolitical position has been bolstered by a particular Russian world theology, and I'm very glad to hear how that position has been challenged, rightly, by other orthodox, vo uh, orthodox voices here in Greece and elsewhere. Russia's position, it seems to me, is both unorthodox and deeply disrespectful of the core values of freedom of religion or belief. Indeed, I would go to, uh, so far as to say and this is my own opinion, but I would so, go so far as to say that the Russian Orthodox Church's uncritical support of President Putin is not a legitimate expression of the Christian faith, but a betrayal of it. The fact is that we simply cannot afford to be religiously illiterate in today's world. To be religiously illiterate in today's world is simply to fail to understand how and why others act as they do. That's why I argued for the Foreign Office to up its game, as we say, in terms of religious literacy, simply so it can do its job better. Again, this is not an option. If you fail to understand the influence of Confucianism, as well as Marxism, on the Chinese Communist Party, you will fail to understand the Chinese Communist Party. If you fail to understand the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in Russian society, you will fail to understand Russia. It's certainly worth asking as we look back on the disaster of Afghanistan whether the key role of religion was critically overlooked there as well. And I note with sadness the failure of all Western governments to recognize and respond to the extreme vulnerability of religious minorities in that country following the Taliban's takeover. So this is a time for action, I believe. I believe that now more than ever, we must defend liberal democracy and the freedoms it guarantees us, including freedom of religion or belief. It is needed now more than ever. We must stand against all those who would betray and undermine it through violence, through crime, through militant nationalism, through authoritarianism, through religious fundamentalism and bigotry. It matters hugely, I believe, to our world today that we should do that. And it matters hugely that we should defend those, those many people whose welfare, liberty, communities, families, and very lives are put at risk by those dark forces in today's world. So I hope that the recommendations of my report make a very significant difference in the days to come. I was proud and honored to present them to the Foreign Secretary and deeply honored that he commissioned me to do so. It is vital that we open our eyes to this issue and recognize it as the very serious issue it undoubtedly is. 
in one of his first speeches to the British House of Commons on the slave trade, William Wilberforce presented the House with Thomas Clarkson's monumental report on the phenomenon. And he said this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. Well, we now know that this, this denial of freedom of religion or belief in today's world is a huge problem too. May we too not look away. May God give us strength instead to face up to this great challenge of our times. Let us do that together, just as Wilberforce and others in their day did too. Thank you very much. We deeply thank you, Your Grace, of your very important input. And uh, allow me to congratulate you for the fact, first of all, that you, you were able to summarize an 170-page report <laughs> into such a limited time. So thank you for that. And uh, allow me to underline some very important remarks that you already uh, raised up. And I think it will lead us to open the discussion after the comments of our esteemed panelists. You spoke about not a problem, and this is the most important uh, reference, but the phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon and uh, persecution of Christians. It is indeed a global phenomenon and we are grateful that our brothers from Africa, from Armenia Church and from, first, of course, of the Patriarchate of Alexandria that you know very well and you are testi testifying what is happening to the majority of the sub-Saharian countries as well as it is in Egypt or in Lebanon or in many other places of the world. You spoke about this global phenomenon and we are grateful that uh, you have achieved to make it a political issue and the UK government adapt your recommendations, your, your 22 recommendations, and now for them it is a key uh, issue for uh, the policy in order to protect religious rights for freedom or belief. And uh, we are grateful that uh, in your uh, team, Sir Charles Huare is here, and uh, I apologize, I wasn't uh, present you lately, and uh, we are grateful that, just for you to know that uh, Sir Charles is the advisor, the, one of the senior advisors of the Foreign Office policy concerning religious freedom issues, and uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, it is really an achievement that you uh, make the UK government to understand how important it is for a democratic state to be in practice a democratic state by protecting uh, the fundamental human rights of uh, protection of religious freedom. And of course, it is uh, a fundamental human right and can never be in a, in a different uh, uh, direction. And also, you mentioned another very ecumenical vocabulary. You spoke about the Global South. And really, this is something that it is a reality. Since I remember 2004, the World Council of Churches has started speaking about uh, this uh, uh, new orientation. West and East was something in the past. And now we have Global North and Global South. Christianity is more flourishing in the Global South. And it is for us a very important issue to protect Christians in those regions. You spoke about violation of religious freedom in many countries, Iraq, the Gazidis, China, India, currently Russia, what has been happening in Crimea. It is something that uh, all of us were suffering. And uh, the position of our Orthodox brothers in Russia makes us feel very sad because this is not an Orthodox belief and this is not the right way to protect human lives. And uh, also the possibility that this report is now uh, accessible to everyone, I think gives you, give us the possibility to make it more and more uh, up to date and uh, adding more and more issues of religious violation and uh, of human rights in many parts of the world. So we are grateful. Your Grace for your work 
and we please uh, allow us to pray to God to give you strength and health to continue your work. And allow me to pass the floor to Metropolitan Athanasius of Achaia for his comment and also of whatever he has prepared for us to, to share with us for the, this very important issue on uh, protection of uh, persecution of Christians in the globe. Yes, Your Eminence, whatever you, whatever you prefer. I shall be more visible if I go there. Because For sure. I felt I was hidden behind this impressive <laughs> table. Very impressive. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, presentation of an impressive report. I would like to reiterate what Metropolitan Gabriel said that it's really remarkable the work you've done, um, certainly with the help of many factors. I was impressed by the number of uh, people you interviewed, the reports you received, and somehow you uh, managed to <coughs> uh, present to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office a comprehensive a report, although you say that it is only an interim report. Uh, no, if the, I the interim report came out at Easter, the final report in the summer, so it is complete. So it is complete. Okay. But I'm sure you agree that it is an ongoing process, and that be because this is life, and so we haven't come to the end, and what you propose in the end indicates exactly the urgency of not letting such a report uh, decorate the archives <laughs> of uh, the administration, yes. wherever. And uh, yes, I would like also to say that Jeffrey Hunt's initiative to uh, ask you to prepare such a report is very important. But you know that not all foreign mini for ministers of foreign affairs are so sensitive and uh, uh, interested in uh, preparing uh, that work. And this tells us something as bishops, as members of the church, that it is very important that we convince the secular authority to cooperate, to finance, to help us uh, put to the fore, bring to the fore uh, so such an important issue, but we cannot really stay and be satisfied with that. Uh, in your presentation, you referred to um, uh, encouraging political uh, factors to enhance the uh, pursuit of means to tackle this pr particular problem. But how much more effective that could be, I wonder, if the churches understood that they, as leaders, are responsible for pursuing this issue as so many other movements have done today. And although it takes time, it requires persistence, Patience, understanding, forgiveness also, uh, and everything that is inspired by the gospel, we need to consider the importance of tackling this problem, at least as we are engaged in the ecumenical dialogue, to resolve theological differences that have been built up through centuries and centuries. And in the end, we come to uh, 
write reports that remain in cupboards. Uh, and this is really very sad. Uh, I think I have participated in the bilateral theological dialogue with the Anglican Church in the past and with the Roman Catholic Church, between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholics. But, and I have pointed out that this is a space for academics, for professors of universities who have the right to participate in the process of bringing us together. But experience since the beginning of the 20th century tells us that we have to learn to do things together if we wish to see understanding and really the ecumenical movement make sense to the wider public because theological discussion is important but it cannot go to the wider public. It remains in the academia. But initiatives of this kind really can uh, bring everybody's interest in on the table of uh, these, these problems. Now, uh, you see, uh, your report is so rich. Uh, I went through it, and I was really uh, inspired by the uh, uh, points of views and also by the complexity of this problem. It is not something, you see, when we speak for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever, we are not able to convey the urgency, the importance, and the complexity of these matters that require uh, really people dedicated to it. It's not a matter of uh, presenting this matter to a closed circle. It's a matter of convincing uh, the leaders of the church to uh, dedicate continuously uh, time, uh, work, money also, uh, to help uh, us understand, first and foremost, as you urged uh, so often in your report, to understand the problems. It's difficult because of the complexity of this problem. But it's also very important that we trust one another. And I have felt in my life so often this challenge of lack of trust among us. And this is the beginning of disunity and a lack of hope for coming to something palpable. I think of so many movements in the 20th century that have been successful. I mean, women's rights. And I am impressed by the persistence of the Jewish community who have rightly uh, tried and managed to maintain the memory of the Holocaust for, uh, well, we've, we have already uh, spent 80 years after the end of World War II, but still museums, uh, I mean, political interventions, we all talk about the Holocaust and we understand the importance of that matter. So we think that we have to do something if we want to be serious concerning the uh, uh, problem, uh, this problem, and not rely on the assistance we get from politicians, because politicians may uh, display interest today and then push this important matter to oblivion. Um, I was impressed by one particular point in your report. Somet yes, uh, you pointed out that we very easily uh, 
condemned and incriminate uh, Islam for uh, the persecution of Christians. But I wonder, <laughs> when I read what is happening in Latin America, a, a, a region of our world where the Roman Catholic Church is the majority, and it, it is the Roman Catholic Church that is targeted yes. in Latin America. Why? Because uh, there are interests uh, from the uh, uh, side of drug dealers, drug traffic traffickers. So uh, there is one um, statement, and I would like to underscore that. You say that what is happening there and elsewhere is not a matter of Islam against Christianity, but it is a matter of power seeking power. And I think this is a very important point in your report because it is a challenge also to politicians who seek power, who represent power. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, if we are left to the decision of power mongers, uh, in the end, we lose track of our mission in the world. Uh, so thank you again uh, for this enriching report. Thank you, so much. Thank, you. thank you, Your Eminence. Thank you for your remarks, Your Eminence. And uh, please, let's now move to Father Ignatius. For, uh, you, may, you want to make a comment? I leave at the end, uh, Dr. Mechanidzidis. But I would like to ask you to be briefly, just to give uh, some time for discussion. As a secretary of the Synodical Committee for Inter-Orthodox and Inter-Christian Relations, and with the permission of my President here, His Eminence, Metropolitan of Dimitrias Ignatius, uh, I would like to congratulate you and your team um, for this uh, wonderful, I would say, uh, report um, that for all of us mean a lot of things and for me personally is the proof that there is still unity uh, among us Christians and it proves that we must go on uh, not only with uh, the official uh, dialogue between our two churches uh, but also uh, between uh, us and the ecumenical movement. And it is very uh, important uh, to speak about uh, openly uh, in, and in the public sphere about the uh, human rights that is also um, one of the interests of the uh, Conference of European Churches, um, where I belong um, still to the governing board. And uh, I think it must be uh, a point, it must be a point of uh, collaboration uh, between uh, CEC and the Anglican uh, Church, and uh, of course all the Christians, and we must obey to the gospel as uh, uh, his eminence Metropolitan Athanasius said, we must obey to the gospel and try to protect the human rights so that the human rights will protect the 
Christian rights and the presence of Christians in the world. I hope that your, uh, uh, finally, that uh, your uh, excellent report will not remain uh, uh, as a good report of a good student at the archives of the Foreign Office and that everybody will adopt uh, the results of your um, so uh, important uh, work. Thank you very much you. once again. Thank you, Father Ignatius. And uh, I, would I would like now to ask uh, to Dr. Mehanidzidis for uh, his remarks and uh, whatever he has prepared to say. Because as I say, presenting Dr. Mehanidzidis, he is an expert in uh, genocides. The Armenians, the Greeks, many knows very well what the genocide means. And uh, nevertheless, uh, Your Grace, Christian persecution can lead to a genocide. So, Dr. Mehanidzidis, the floor is yours. You want to take the mic here? Okay. As I am not yet a bishop nor an archman, right, I will contend with your permission uh, to, to, to stay here on, on the table. Clarify that. <laughs> In uh, the medieval Muslim Arab states and the Ottoman Empire, anti-Christian persecution and sentiment found its expression in many ways. In the process of conquest, which according to Sharia law entailed killing, plundering, rape of women and boys, enslavement, Islamization of temples and persons, but also the discriminatory distinction between Muslims and non-Muslims, the dhimmis or semi-slaves, and the ensuing discrimination against the latter ones on the part of the first ones. Many Christians were persecuted or killed during the Armenian, Assyrian and Greek genocides in what Israel, Israel Charney called the first holocaust of the 20th century. <coughs> Benny Morris and Dror Zevi argue that the destruction of the indigenous Christian peoples in the Ottoman Empire constitutes a collective extermination campaign or genocide carried out by the Ottoman Empire against its Christian subjects. Islamism and the concept of and practice of holy war, the last one being declared in 1914, and nationalism have played a significant role in creating the ideological and technical conditions and frame for anti-Christian persecution which led to genocide and ethnocide. Long-term persecution could actually lead to genocide. Nowadays, Christians are persecuted in some parts of the Arab and Islamic world. ISIS applied new concepts and practices of holy war. The Islamic State is responsible for terrible persecution against Christians, Yazidis and even heretic Muslims. I will, not I will personally not forget the stories of ISIS I had from Christians from Syria when I hosted some of them in my house. In neighboring Turkey, we witnessed not only the complete disappearance of the autochthonous Christian peoples when the first Turkish tribes arrived in Asia Minor in the 11th century, there were nearly 13 million Christians there. In 1922, barely one million was uh, able to survive after uh, 700 years of Islamic uh, conquest and rule. The destruction of cultural heritage uh, in neighboring Turkey, we are witness of an ongoing ethnocide, that, that is the destruction of cultural heritage through the conversion of churches into mosques. The Hagia Sophia of Constantinople, the Hagia Sophia of Trebizond, the Hagia Sophia of Nicaea have been converted lately into mosques. 
the destruction of the religious and cultural heritage in the Turkish occupied territories of Cyprus are also forms of persecution. The destruction of cultural heritage in Artsakh, Nagorno Karabakh, is also well reported in international media. It has not yet attracted the attention which all of that has gone into what is happening in uh, Ukraine. Um, Archbishop Welby has made statements demonstrating international concern for freedom of religion and belief, and specifically, specifically towards the Middle East. Your report said persecution was, I quote, perhaps at its most virulent in the region of the birthplace of Christianity. Is this related to aspects inherent to Islam? How do you assess things today? This is my first question, then I have a few more. <laughs> you done? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehanejidis. And just make a small comment on what you have already mentioned, that uh, you remind us historically how much we have suffered the Greeks, the Armenians, the Copts, many other brothers and sisters from different parts uh, of the world and especially to our neighbor region which is Middle East and we thank you for that as well as you gave us another aspect that uh, already you spoke Your Grace in your report concerning the uh, global problems that we need to face that can create uh, injustices and the violation of human rights, such as, such as climate change and, uh, or, of course, the pandemic. But Vasilis also raised another issue, which is migration. Yeah. And uh, you can understand very well that persecution of Christians can really create huge waves of uh, migration, forced people to migrate for a better and more secure sp space. We see that in Afghanistan and especially in Syria. We have witnessed that in the last years in, uh, in our country. And uh, allow me just to give you now the floor for a small uh, response to and uh, re a reaction of what you have already heard from the three panelists. And then we will open the floor for discussion. Your uh, Grace, please. Thank you. You can sit in your whatever you like. Huh? It's I'll, I'll, I'll start. Okay, no, okay. I'm here now. Um, first of all, thank you, all, all three of you, for those really helpful um, observations and um, and comments. So let me try and uh, and respond to them. And if I forget some, then uh, remind me. Um, I think that the, the the first thing is is I I, I absolutely agree with with the point that um, we as Christians and as churches together we need to be activists in all of this. This is not something that we can leave to politicians. We owe it to uh, we owe it to one another. Um, so, as as I said, I was I'm particularly pleased that following the report, um, we set up this um, forum roundtable of lots of different agencies uh, who are committed to this issue together. So, what we said was, in order to belong to this forum, you you needed simply to be committed to Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and you need to be committed to the principle of nonviolence. And any organization that could be committed to both those two things could join the forum. And as I say, the, the focus of the forum is on taking action together. And there, is a, there's a, there are a growing number of these fora around the world. Um, and uh, Charles could possibly, if you want informally, to tell you, to tell you more about that. Um, I think we, we would love to, to see something like that established in, in, in Greece, perhaps. Um, but I, I, it, is, it is not the only way, but I think it is an effective way of, um, of us of, of making common cause with other people who believe in this issue. But I absolutely believe that as Christians we must be activists and active in this issue. I also wanted to pick up the point that I do think this is an issue that deserves to be owned broadly by politicians. And if I can speak personally and honestly um, one of my concerns about the situation 
in the UK at the moment is that there are plenty of conservative politicians who see the importance of this issue. I don't think it has yet been recognized as the important issue it is by people more on the left. I think it deserves to be for the reasons that I, that I outlined. I don't think this is an issue of left or right. This is an issue of, of justice uh, and of equality for, for everybody. So one of our challenges at the moment is to, is to um, bend the ear, as we say, of, of, of people on the left and ensure that there's some, um, there's, there's some buy-in to that issue um, a, 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 as well. Um, I absolutely take the point. I, I don't. I don't want to be heard in what I'm in what I was saying as suggesting that there is not a problem with elements of uh, Islam, uh, because there clearly are. And one of the things that I've been involved in recently is the the annual um, Contemporary Martyrs Day, which is organised by Archbishop Angelos of the Coptic Orthodox Church in in the UK where we remember the 21 Coptic martyrs who were murdered on the beach by, by ISIS, and that's, a, that's become a solemn day in the calendar. Um, so I do recognize that uh, um, Islamists uh, represent a very, very serious challenge to freedom of religion or belief. Um, but I, I also want to say this is a complex global issue. You raised the issue, for instance, that the most dangerous place in the world to be a Roman Catholic priest is in Mexico. Um, so this is a global phenomenon with lots of different causes, lots of different drivers, and I think we, we, we do have to continue um, to, to, to recognize that. And as I say, there are, there are extreme right-wing people in the UK who would love to say this is only about Islam. If we say it's only about Islam, then we, we would, for instance, be, be, be closing our minds and our hearts to the suffering of Muslim communities, say the Uyghur Muslims in um, uh, in, in, in China. So I, I think those are, the, those are the particular issues I want to pick up from, from what you said. I do just want to say one other thing, and that is, and I should have said this before, you are extremely kind to this person from England in conducting all of this in English, and I'm very grateful for that. Eve, even, even as I was speaking, I was conscious of how many of the words I was using come from Greek, and how, how impoverished the English language would be without Greek vocabulary in it. So uh, we, 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 in so many things, we are in your debt. Uh, but I particularly just want to thank you for your kindness in conducting this conversation in English today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Your Eminence, uh, Your Grace. And uh, since you made this uh, remark, allow me to say that thank you for the very nice and good English. Because <laughs> we can very much participate in that. So before I open the floor for discussion, I will kindly ask Sir Charles or if he has something to uh, say as in addition or a small remark, please. I think we'll be very much grateful to hear from you what uh, you have to want to contribute in this fruitful discussion. Thank you, Your Eminence, thank you, thank thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to write something. Um, really just to um, follow um, His Grace Bishop Philip, um, not only to, to thank the Foreign Office for their kindness in, uh, during the review, but also to highlight um, the, the willingness to conduct a review of the review after three years. This was a recommendation that was accepted. But even so, um, to do that so thoroughly um, and to commission uh, some of the leading advisers um, uh, assisting the Foreign Office on human rights um, was, was hugely appreciated. Um, simply to say that the, uh, the review of the review um, uh, was honest and recognized that um, the Foreign Office as a whole had made significant strides to, to implement uh, the recommendations. Um, some of the recommendations are still in the process of being implemented. Uh, some of them have proved extremely difficult to implement, in part because they go outside the bailiwick, outside the, the area of authority 
uh, direct authority of the Foreign Office um, and address wider governmental um, concerns. We continue to, to hope and pray that they will be taken, taken up, those wider issues, um, by government as a whole in, in London. If I might briefly then um, uh, comment on the, the, the wider movement to establish uh, fora and, and round tables in this area and to, to reiterate Bishop Phillips' uh, encouragement to consider creating uh, an entity here um, in Athens, the opportunity really um, to look outside the particular context uh, at persecution and discrimination around the world is the focus of these forums, and that is really important. It's not looking at religious harmony or difficulties within a country, but rather galvanizing um, uh, religious and non-religious communities to, to look outside, to see what they might be able to do to help to uh, oppose attacks on um, religious and belief freedoms under Article 18. Our experience in London is that this is, has a very positive impact on the relationships amongst those communities in London, but also keeps a focus on the challenges and the difficulties around the world. So I commend it. Um, I do hope that we can do anything we can to support the emergence of uh, such a body here. Thank you, Your Eminence, for the opportunity to, to comment. Thank you, Sir Charles. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, I think it's very important what you mentioned, that uh, this report needs to be an initial point for a continuing process, as His Eminence <coughs> Athanasius uh, mentioned before, of having the report a process for a bigger wave, a movement of uh, understanding how we have to act in order to protect every minority, not only the Christians, but every minority. So please, I open the floor for discussion. I want you please to be briefly to ask something. We have uh, around 20 minutes. So please, yes, if you can say your name as well. Thank you. Would you like to come to the mic if you I just to hear? From my place. Thank okay, you. okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Your Eminence, for uh, firstly for your presence here in the Holy Synod of uh, Orthodox Church of Greece, and secondly for your uh, uh, analytic report that you, uh, you said to us. You sent it to us. Thank you, Professor. Please. Shall I go up there so we can all Yes, go? yes. I, I, I shall be brief, although the word brief has been used many times today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my name's William Manninson. I represent myself, plus the Journal of Balkan and Near Eastern wow. Studies. Um, two things, very brief. First difficult question for anybody. Is the West in moral decline? <laughs> <laughs> Literally. I see amazing things like a law in Spain now whereby people can um, do naughty things to animals as long as they don't harm the animal. I see strange laws about children in the Netherlands. We know what I'm talking about. Children being asked w whether they're male or female at the age of five. All this stuff. Is the West in decline? Second, more, slightly more serious. Um, quite rightly, in this beautiful report, huge report, Herculean task, which I hope will continue so that the words don't coagulate, 
and that it'll end up in the archives. It's this, the problem of politics and religion. You began quite rightly with Russian aggression. Now, how political was the decision of our patriarch in Constantinople to recognize a separate uh, new, new Church of Ukraine in Ukraine, and has that caused spiritual strife? So was that slightly political, and was it strictly necessary? Um, that's it, and I don't want to be difficult, but yeah. I love a bit of thought. I can't help it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, please, please. Um, let me t try and take those in, in, in reverse order. It's really not my place, I think, to comment on issues within uh, orthodoxy, uh, but I will. Um, <laughs> I, I will simply say I think that one of the... Um, well, let me, let, let me comment on... Let me start by commenting on the Church of England. I think we have a, we have a sense in the Church of England that we have a calling to, to serve the nation to recognise the particularity of um, of England. Of course, we're not. You know, we don't. Uh, the Church of England and England are not exactly the same thing because uh, Father Leonard here is uh, a priest in the Church of England, and here he is ministering in Athens. So we have a broad view, you might um, you might say. But I do think that sense of relationship between church and state is important. And I do think that the, the, the recognition of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is part and parcel of the recognition of Ukraine and, and Ukrainian identity as something distinct. And I think that is, I think that's, for myself, I would say, I think that's a strength and I think that's a good thing. And it seems to me to be within, to be within the tradition of orthodoxy to recognize national identity. Um, I don't think churches should ever be too too closely identified with national identity. I think that's one of the problems in Russia. We need to have, we need to have a prophetic distance, if I may put it like that, from the state so we can speak to the state. Um, but that, that, I think that's all I want to say about, um, about the situation in Ukraine. Um, I think the only thing I want to say about, um, I, I think there is no doubt that the, the, the Western nations, and I, not including Greece in that, not because I don't think you're Western, as it were, but the tradition is different. But Western European nations, um, I think they, they, are, they are fast separating from their Christian roots. Uh, Stanley Havas, who is an American ethicist, um, he says that if in 100 years' time we're the people who are known for not killing our children and elderly people, we will have done well. I think that's a very sobering reflection, but I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, uh, and just to say personally, to pick up your, your point, Seth, um, I, I, I'm being nominated at the moment as a vice president of Keck, so I hope to join you oh, in Keck. Please. And um, I do feel, I do genuinely feel that this is a cause that God has laid upon my heart. I thought that I would be called to do this piece of work for six months and then lay it down whilst it may be gathered dust on a shelf in the archives, um, but it hasn't. And I, just as my report continues to um, provoke action, so I feel that I need to be continued, continue to be committed to this and that, that is something that uh, I will continue to give e effort, energy, focus and prayer to in the years to come. Thank you. Your Yes, I, first His Eminence, and then please you, okay? Please, Your Eminence. Thank you, Your Grace, for the beautiful report. And we can imagine, all of us, how many diffi how difficult it was for you to prepare it during, because of your duties as a spiritual uh, person as well. So to spend so much time we can understand all of us how difficult it is and how much effort it needs. It's a pity and a shame in uh, 17 centuries after the first proclamation of uh, freedom of religious from St. Constantine to have to be activists to protect our rights and to be apologetics as Christians. This is very sad, especially in this area that we call Europe, which is 
protecting human rights and uh, all this stuff. But we see that um, persecution, it doesn't happen only in Africa or in Asia or in India. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vasilis, because you mentioned the churches in uh, Cyprus. Cyprus is a part of Europe. And we see every we witness every day what's going on there. And um, last night the, they killed seven Jehovah Witness in Hamburg, in Germany, yes. and many injured. So it is is knocking the door also in Europe. Yes. Uh, how serious you UK is uh, looking after this uh, issue? We witness it with the report, with the three years you spent for this, but with the presence of the representative of the Foreign Office and the UK ambassador. That means you are taking seriously this issue. Uh, of course, it's not an issue for the Ukrainian autocephalicity today, but I want to make my point, uh, not as an official uh, answer to the request, but... Um, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine didn't start because of the autocephalicity of the Church of Ukraine. It, it started because of other reasons. Ukraine has 44 million uh, Orthodox. The Patriarch of Moscow doesn't speak Ukrainian. The majority of the people, of the bishops in Ukraine, doesn't speak Russian. So this church cannot have autocephalicity. The Church of uh, Moscow, they recognize recently uh, the autocephalicity in the Northern Macedonian Church, which is going to be a big issue. So Northern Macedonia um, maybe have 500,000 Orthodox, 600,000 Orthodox, so they can be autocephalous, but the 44 million of Orthodox in Ukraine cannot be. So it's a big issue. It cannot be answered and resolved now. But um, just think about it. And the big problem is that they are killing each other. Orthodox are killing each other. What happened in Middle Ages is repeating again. And what worried me more was that um, because during the Easter time, even the Sunday of the Easter, while all the Orthodox were celebrating the Vespers of Agapi, in uh, Russia and Ukraine they had war and they were killing each other. So uh, we have to take um, initiatives about that to protect these innocent people, the young people, the students, the children, the mother who spent so much effort to make her child to grow up and be uh, an adult and now she she received him dead in a coffin because of this stupid war and to pray all for all of them and for all the Christians and all other religions that they are persecuted uh, all over the world first of, by first of all respecting the degree of St. Constantine which is an international law and we don't follow and we don't respect it and we don't accept it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> I think that we have to thank your eminence that uh, you made now our sisters and brothers from the Anglican Church aware of our challenges in the Orthodox world. <laughs> so thank you so much. Please. Uh, thank you, Bishop, for the presentation. Uh, I don't want to be sarcastic. But please tell us who you are, please, your name. I'm Dr. George Bennett. Uh, but when we deal with such matters, we have to be sincere just to work with ourselves. Nowadays, in Western universities, we have massive extermination of Christian values. We ask from the wolf to protect the sheep. If you present a unitary and idyllic situation in human rights law, that is not correct. Global South does not want to buy our ideology. What Pope Benedict said is that now in Europe we have under the name of pluralism the relativization of everybody. 
How we can persuade these people to follow the European standards when we don't believe in this? When we have these contradictory statements, from one point we say we protect Christianity, and from another point we destroy it, our past. So the problem is, it comes and I'm, I'm, I'm penalizing. From a legal point of view, at the international level, the intergovernmental method was a total failure. Because we have written some nice books about missionary work. We have to catch the societies, the societies of the third world, the civil societies. This requires another approach. We don't have to beg for, for mercy from foreign offices, whatever country uh, we are dealing with. We have to change the method. And the method is to have, first of all, to be honest with ourselves, and second, to understand what's the real problem, what we want to sell to the third world. Uh, of course, there are crimes from uh, uh, Islamist groups and all that kind of stuff. But we don't have the moral uh, prestige or the moral argument to persuade these people that we have something to be imitated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please, Your Eminence. I am Bishop Pavlos of the Coptic Orthodox Church here in Greece. I would like to thank all of you, all of the people who were talking to us about the persecution of the Christians. But, but, big but. Here we have his eminence who were talking to us about the persecution of the Christians all over the world. And here is the ambassador of the United Kingdom. I'm not talking at all from the personal point of view, but from the ecclesiastical Egyptian point of view. We heard about the persecution of the Christians all over the world. But all of this, for me at least, I look at it as paradox. Why paradox? Because while the Church of England is talking about the persecution of the Christians, we look from the other point of view, some European governments encourages encouraging the Islamists to govern Egypt. And this is a big question mark because we heard a lecture and I think it's the opinion of the Church of England. But I would like to ask the policy of the United Kingdom if the policy of the United Kingdom is encouraging the Islamists to govern, to govern Egypt where we are all. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Just please, before I give you the floor, Your, your, your Grace, we stand in solidarity with you, Your Eminence. We need you to know that from 
uh, the bottom of our heart. Uh, I would like to, because we have to conclude, before I give the floor to His Grace to respond to all the remarks and challenges, uh, Dr. Mechanetis would like to say something. And then, please, Your Grace, we will give you the floor to conclude. And uh, we thank you once again for your patience. Please, Dr. Mechanetis. I appreciate it very much, your report and then your presentation here. However, I must admit I was particularly perplexed by one point you mentioned uh, when you referred to the Crusades. Um, and I was wondering how much the report you made was f made from a, a colonial, formerly colonial perspective in which, you know, uh, you viewed things as with the typical Western feeling of guilt for being, you know, a formerly colonial uh, power. And how much you succeeded actually in introducing into your view and into the report the, the experience of the colonized people uh, uh, like ourselves, because we have been colonized by Islam and uh, Islam uh, uh, succeeded through holy war to, uh, to conquer Constantinople and then to arrive to the gates of Vienna. Uh, and I think that it is important to integrate into our view uh, not only that moral decline. The second point I would like to make, and I would like to link that uh, to what Dr. Benos said, is uh, uh, the fact that um, we are uh, witnesses of a growing Christianophobia, and COVID was actually uh, um, uh, 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 an illustration of that growing Christianophobia and the debate around uh, uh, Holy Eucharist, especially in the Orthodox tradition and in the way we receive Holy Communion, that all became, you know, part of, uh, of a growing, uh, uh, if you want, ideological and scientific terrorism on, on, on our tradition. And, uh, and to, to further broaden this issue with what Dr. Banner said is to say uh, what we have to endure many ways uh, when we have to uh, defend our ethical views around abortion, marriage uh, and other issues uh, in, in, in the public debate we are having in, in the West where human rights and freedom of expression are supposed to be uh, guaranteed in theory but in practice um, uh, we are uh, often terrorized by, uh, by media and by academia when we have to defend uh, our values. Please, Mr. Philip. Uh, just briefly, and I, I don't think I will begin to do justice to the really important points that have been, um, that have been made. Um, I think, uh, first of all, as, as, as regards the Crusades, you know, I, I can only speak from my perspective as someone from, from the UK, uh, born, as you, you said, in 1959, a baby boomer, um, a, a, a child of the Cold War, uh, etc. Um, and I do want to recognize that the perspective on the Crusades here and, the perspe and, and particularly the perspective on colonialism here is, is bound to be very different than, than, than mine is. And I do recognize that, that Greece was um, a colony and, and repressed and subjected um, to the dimitude and all the rest of it in, in, in the way that it was. And uh, if, I, if I have overlooked that or been disrespectful of that in any way, then I would certainly want to, um, want, want, want to apologize for that. Um, I, I would also, I don't for one minute want to be seen to be complacent about the situation in my country or the situation in, uh, in, in, in Western Europe um, more generally. One of the 
Um, the, the UK Freedom of Religion or Belief Forum that Charles referenced mm -hmm. has a number of different working groups that are looking at a number of significant issues in the world today. So there's a working group on freedom of religion or belief and gender. There's a working group on Iraq. And we're just setting up one on, on Europe and trying to look at some of these really important issues that you, that, that you raised. And I'm, I'm not for one minute complacent about, about those things. I, I do believe that they are, they are really important. I would also suggest that there are some inconsistent, I, and I, I also want to say I don't presume to speak for Her Majesty's government any more actually than I speak for the Church of England, I speak for myself, certainly won't presume to speak for Her Majesty's government, but I do believe there are some real inconsistencies. So um, just a couple of days ago, the UK government produced uh, a draft bill which is ironically called the Illegal Migration Bill. Some people may say the government wants the illegal to refer to migration. Other people want to suggest <laughs> that the bill itself is illegal. Um, my, my, um, I tweeted and I, I said, I do not understand how this repressive bill um, can possibly be held together with the UK's commitment to, to freedom of religion or belief when supporting the persecuted. So we'll support the persecuted anywhere else in the world, will we, but turn them away from our own shores? You know, so there is there is some there is some real inconsistency um, in all of that. I think I think as far so I, I don't want you to think that I'm complacent about the situation in Western Europe at all, because I'm not. Um, I think central to my argument, though, was that I think I think the UK has become so ashamed of its colonial past that it has tried to wash its hands of the responsibility that goes with that. Uh, and, 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 and it cannot, um, you know, a, a, a lot of what we continue to see happening in the world today is, is the legacy of colonialism, the way that boundaries in the, the Middle East and in Africa were drawn up and which, in, which enshrine um, inter-tribal, inter-communal conflict. That's, that's all the legacy of colonialism. So I want, one of the things I was wanting to say to the British government was, you cannot wash your hands of this. There, there is enduring responsibility. The UK is no longer a colonial power, um, but we have a seat at the Security Council. We're, we're, we're a nuclear power. Sadly, I want to say, very sadly, we're no longer a member of the European Union. But we do have, we do have influence in the world, and we need to use that influence positively. And to say, as I said in, in my address, we've interfered uninvited in global context in the past, so we should just wash our hands of all that now, is I think not an acceptable uh, position. I, I, want, I want my country to be actively engaged in this, in this issue, to be a force for good in the world, to look to keep its own house in order as well as <coughs> addressing concerns internationally. Um, I, think, I think Greece, with its um, deeply embedded Christian culture, Christian conscience, if I may say that as well, has a significant role to play in this as well. And I, I, I think we need to commit ourselves to being partners in this cause together uh, as much as we possibly can be. And I, I look forward to our continuing partnership in this. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that uh, this forum was a very fruitful one. And we have to praise God for this opportunity, as well as your personality, your grace, uh, Bishop of Truro, and uh, I ask you all to show your appreciation with an applause for his grace. I would like to thank you once again to assure you that we will continue to be united in prayers and we will pray to God to give you strength to continue your important work, and since now you, are, you will be serving as the Vice President in Kek, this is something very important for the church role and contribution. And uh, we, th we thank you that uh, Sir Charles is with us and for, his, for his, his contribution. And once again, I would like to ask you all to show our appreciation to our good brother in Christ, Father Dulan, for his very important <laughs> initiative. Without you, we couldn't realize that. Thank you. Yes, please, please, please. Uh, 
I will be even briefer than <laughs> Professor Mallinson. Uh, I'm enormously grateful uh, to um, your, your eminence and to Archimandrites of Tiriadis for the very gracious help and support that uh, they have offered to enable this opportunity to happen. Tomorrow we will go to the Metoki of um, uh, His Eminence of, of Guinea uh, and we look forward to a more informal, smaller discussion of these issues uh, tomorrow. So uh, again, nice thank to you. see you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you. Um, before we go for a small refreshment that we will offer you outside, I will kindly ask our president of the Synodical Committee, Metropolitan Ignatius, to present to you and to Sir Charles two small memorandum in behalf of the Archbishop of Athens and all Greece by showing you our appreciation and our esteem and fraternal love to you and to your family and to your church. Thank you. Remember us. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Sir Charles. Thank you. Charles, could you just bring me Your eminence, your eminence, stay, stay here, please, stay here. Sorry, my, my, my assistant here. <laughs> Excuse me. So I have, I have something very small, I'm afraid, to present to you. But um, when, when St. Piran came from Ireland to bring the good news to Cornwall, uh, they, he set up a cross. Yes. And that, I, I took a photo of the cross. And in our diocese, we, give, we award the cross of St. Piran to people who've given outstanding service within the diocese. And I, I, Thank I'm you so much. To present this to you. Thank you, Your Grace. Thank you all. Please let go out for a small refreshment. <laughs>